Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Karens, and this is a lecture over the transport of respiratory gases in our blood. So this has to do with the respiratory system. So in my previous videos, we've talked about what's going on during pulmonary ventilation. And we've also talked about what's going on during external and internal respiration. So this section is going to pick up on that. So I'm going to remind you what's going on during external and internal respiration, um, which is really ultimately the whole point of the respiratory system anyway, right? So at, in external respiration, we're talking about um, gas exchange and in particular oxygen, moving of oxygen between the lungs and the blood. So we're at the lungs here. We've just breathed in some air. The oxygen in, in those lungs is moving from the air in the lungs and getting into the blood at the lungs. And it's doing that because there's a pressure gradient, right? There's more oxygen in the air in the lungs than there is in the blood at the tissues. And so oxygen is moving from the lungs to the blood. In internal respiration, we're talking about what's going on between the blood and our tissue cells. So the oxygen, if we're talking about oxygen in particular, that is moving from the blood to the tissues because of its pressure gradient. When we are at the tissues, there is more oxygen in the blood than there is in the tissue cells. And so oxygen moves out of the blood and into the tissues. And that is a, a simplified view of what's going on there. What makes it a little more complicated is how the oxygen is being carried in the blood to begin with. Most of that oxygen, almost all of it, is bound to hemoglobin. Go back and look at chapter 17, which is the blood chapter, where they talk about the structure of hemoglobin and um, the fact that there are these four heme groups that have iron on them. That's where the oxygen is being bound to. So each hemoglobin can hold on to four oxygen molecules. And when it's saturated, we call it oxyhemoglobin. So most of that blood, or sorry, most of that oxygen, when it's in our blood, is being held on to hemoglobin. So this adds a layer of complexity to the movement of oxygen between either the lungs and the blood or the blood and the tissues. And let's think about what has to happen now. If we're asking oxygen to move from the lungs to the blood, not only is it moving into the blood, but it's also getting into the red blood cells and latching onto hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is holding onto it very tightly. But when we're at the tissues, we are expecting that oxygen to leave the blood and go into the tissue cells. And it has to do something else first before it can do that. If it's being held onto hemoglobin, and hemoglobin's holding onto it really tightly, in order for that oxygen to leave the blood, it has to be unloaded by the hemoglobin or the hemoglobin has to let it go so the oxygen can leave the blood and go into the tissues. How does hemoglobin know that when it's in the blood at our, at our lungs, how does it know to hold on to oxygen tightly versus when that blood is at the tissues how does hemoglobin know to let go of it? And that's what we're going to talk about here. There's a lot of factors involved that are going to basically change hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen in order for that oxygen to go where it needs to go. So let's look at what's our next slide. Okay. So um, one of the things to note is that, and let's talk about when we're at the lungs, that oxygen is leaving the lungs and getting into the blood and then entering the red blood cells, and it's going to start latching onto hemoglobin. As soon as hemoglobin grabs onto one oxygen, it makes it a lot easier for it to grab onto three more. So the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen is going to increase with increasing amounts of oxygen around. 
Um, and then at the tissues, it's the opposite. As soon as hemoglobin lets go of one oxygen, it becomes a lot easier to let go of more and more oxygens. So that's part of it. Um, but there are other factors that will influence how, how much oxygen the hemoglobin is holding on to and how tightly it can hold on to those oxygens. So not only is it the amount of oxygen that's around, but also temperature of the blood, the pH of the blood, how much carbon dioxide is in the blood, and then how much of this chemical called BPG is in the blood. So we're going to talk about these. How do they influence um, that affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen, or how tightly will that hemoglobin hold on to that oxygen? And, and again, coming back to the big picture is when we're at the lungs, when we're in the blood, when we're in the blood at the lungs, we want hemoglobin to have a high affinity for oxygen. We want it to be able to hold on to that oxygen very tightly. But when we're at the tissues, we need hemoglobin to lose some affinity for that oxygen and let go of that oxygen so it can unload the oxygen and allow the oxygen to leave the blood and get into the tissues. That is what's happening at those two points of um, the two areas in the body. But, but we can look at this a little more closely to figure out why that's happening. So this is something called um, an oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. And you're going to need to know how to read one of these and how to explain one of these come test time. So it's really important that you understand what's going on here and if you have questions that you ask those questions. So in general, I'm looking at this curve on the left of our screen. What are we looking at? The x-axis is showing you amounts of oxygen or partial pressures of oxygen in the blood, and they're going up as you move to the right. The y-axis is showing you basically how saturated hemoglobin is, and you can see at the bottom there's no oxygens on the hemoglobin. Now there's one, now there's two, now there's three, and now there's four, and that would be considered 100% saturated. Hemoglobin is fully saturated with oxygen. So in general, when you're looking at this graph, we're really just looking at how amounts of oxygen will affect saturation of hemoglobin. As the amount of oxygen is going up, saturation of hemoglobin is going up as well. So when you have a lot of oxygen around, like 100 millimeters of mercury, the hemoglobin is 100% saturated with oxygen, so fully saturated. So that's how we're looking at this curve. Versus, let's look over here. When, when the amount of oxygen is at 40 millimeters of mercury, look at the curve. Now hemoglobin is only 75% saturated. These two points on this graph are showing you what's happening when the blood is at the lungs versus at the tissues. So looking over now to the right, when we're at when we're the blood is at the lungs and and that that oxygen is leaving the lungs and entering the blood. We've got a lot of oxygen in the blood because of that. If you're at sea level, you there's about 100 millimeters of uh, mercury of oxygen that amount of oxygen in your blood. And that corresponds now to 100% saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. So all of the hemoglobins are fully saturated with oxygen here. Um, and this is at the lungs. This is what's happening in the blood at the lungs. If you're, if you're at a higher altitude than sea level, there's not as much oxygen in the environment to begin with, in the air. So you're not breathing in as much oxygen. And so the amount of oxygen that's in your blood at the lungs is only about 80 millimeters of mercury. And that corresponds to about 95% um, about saturation. So let me go back and say, if, if you're at sea level, I said originally that was 100% saturation. It's never 100%. It's more like 98, 99% saturation. But it's still a lot. And even at you know other areas and ardent sea level, we still have a lot of oxygen in our blood at the lungs, and therefore a high saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen, fully saturated for our for all intents and purposes. But when we're at the tissues, things are different. So down here we're at the tissues. 
there is not as much oxygen in our blood there because it is leaving the blood. And so we only have maybe about 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in our blood. And that corresponds on our curve to only 75% saturation of hemoglobin, meaning hemoglobin has lost an oxygen. And yes, we expect that because the oxygen is leaving the blood and going into our tissues. Um, if you're exercising, you have even less oxygen in your blood because your cells are using it so quickly. And that means hemoglobin is even less saturated. It's only saturated about 40%. So what these graphs are showing you that at any given amount of oxygen in the blood, how much how fully saturated is that hemoglobin? Is it he, is it 100% saturated? Is it 75% saturated? Anywhere on the curve will tell you how much the hemoglobin is saturated with how much oxygen is in the blood. What these curves are not telling you right now is why is it like this? Why is um why is the hemoglobin saturation so high at the lungs and not as high at the tissues? Yes, because there's less oxygen in the blood at the tissues than there is in the lungs. But what what it what it's really not telling you is what is making hemoglobin let go of that oxygen and allowing the oxygen to leave the blood and get to the tissues or up here in the lungs. What is telling the hemoglobin to hang on to all that oxygen that's in the blood? What are the factors that are are changing the affinity that he, for oxygen that hemoglobin has? Or what are the factors that are changing how tightly hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen? Is it holding on to it or is it letting it go like it is in the tissues? What are those factors that are changing those things? And that's where we're going to move on to the next slide, because now we're going to talk about, um, I, I want to look at this at this um, slide right here. Now we're going to talk about what those factors are. So um, let me go back to our original page here. And I, I had introduced what those factors are that are influencing hemoglobin saturation. Yes, the amount of oxygen that's around, but also these other factors too, temperature, pH, carbon dioxide, and BPG. So let's look at, at this slide right here where it's showing you why, well, it's actually showing you how the hemoglobin saturation changes with some of these factors, but then I'm going to talk about why that's the case. So first, let's just look at this curve right here on the top. This is showing you, and they don't show it on the x-axis, but if you look at the curve on the bottom, you can see the x-axis is amount of oxygen. So I'm going to just kind of extrapolate here. On the curve at the bottom, at the hash mark, the fourth hash mark represents 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. So I'm going to just pretend that's true up here too. I don't know why it's not on this picture. So here where my mouse is right now, that represents 40 millimeters of, of mercury of oxygen. So amount of oxygen in the blood, 40. When um, And then we're looking at, again, how much um, of the hemoglobin how much hemoglobin is saturated? To what extent is that hemoglobin saturated with oxygen? The normal curve that we were just looking at in the previous slide is this purple curve on this particular graph. Um, so at 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, hemoglobin is about 75% saturated, give or take. If you change the temperature of that blood, the um, the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen is going to change. So for example, change the temperature to a higher temperature. Let's look at this um, pink line on this graph now. The temperature is increased to 43 degrees. Look at the same amount of oxygen. So 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. And now what is the saturation of hemoglobin? Now it's only about maybe 55. Whereas when we were at normal body temperature, it was 75. What does that mean? That means that normal body temperature, when we have 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in the blood, the hemoglobin is 75% saturated with that oxygen. 
But if the blood temperature is higher than that, if it's at 43 degrees, then only maybe half saturated. The hemoglobin is only about 50% or a little more than that, 55% saturated, meaning it has less oxygen bound to it. So what does that mean? That means higher temperatures are going to decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, meaning higher temperatures are going to make it easier for hemoglobin to loosen its grip on oxygen and unload its oxygen. And as a result, oxygen is going to leave the blood. So this is what's happening at our tissues. Our tissues, our blood there is a little bit warmer than body temperature because the tissue cells that the blood is surrounding are metabolically active. They're doing cellular respiration over and over and over again, and that generates heat. So that warms the blood a little bit, not a lot, but enough to change the, the temperature of the blood, and it's a little bit higher than body temperature. That higher temperature makes it easier for hemoglobin to let go of that oxygen, and it has a lower affinity of oxygen, a lower saturation. And that means it's unloading its oxygen and therefore the oxygen can leave the tissue, leave the blood and go to the tissues. And that's what we need, right? If our tissues are metabolically active, they're doing cellular respiration, they need the oxygen to do that. So that's, we need that to happen. These other factors have the same effect. We don't have graphs for every one of them, um, but, but they will do the same thing. Let's look at carbon dioxide. So that's the graph down here on the bottom. Um, again, we're looking at the percent of oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. How, how much oxygen is on that hemoglobin for how much oxygen is in the blood? The purple is the normal curve. Let's go back to our example of 40. 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, we have about 75% saturation of hemoglobin. But let's increase the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the blood. That shifts, just like the increase in temperature, that shifts the curve to the right, meaning at the same amount of oxygen, there's less saturation of hemoglobin due to the presence of carbon dioxide. Why is that? Well, and this is happening again at the tissues. There's more carbon dioxide in the blood at the tissues, right? Yes, there is. We learned that with internal respiration. Those metabolically active cells, they're constantly doing cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that. It's building up in the cells. The cells don't want it. It's poisonous to them. That carbon dioxide leaves down its gradient, leaves the tissues, and goes into the blood. So now the blood at the tissues has a lot more carbon dioxide than it had before. And that presence of carbon dioxide actually literally kicks off the oxygen from the hemoglobin because um, carbon dioxide, we'll find out a little bit later, some of that that's in our blood will get carried by hemoglobin as well. And it's almost like hemoglobin can't carry oxygen and carbon dioxide at the same time. It has to carry one or the other. So if there's more carbon dioxide around, it's going to almost outcompete the spots on hemoglobin. It's going to compete with the oxygen. It's going to kick that oxygen off. So presence of carbon dioxide makes it easier for the hemoglobin to let go of that oxygen, to unload its oxygen. The oxygen leaves the hemoglobin, it leaves the blood, it goes into the tissues. Um, other things that will do the same thing, they're shifting this curve to the right. Increases in hydrogen ion concentration. Another way to think of that is an increase in acid or a decrease in pH. That is due to the presence of carbon dioxide. And I'll illustrate that a little more, um, a little better in a minute when I have a chemical equation for you to look at. But for now, associate um, the presence of carbon dioxide in the blood with the presence of acid. And those go hand in hand. BPG, that is a chemical that is produced by your red blood cells. It shows up in meta in the tissue in the blood at the tissues due to metabolism of cells 
So there's more BPG in our blood at the tissues due to that metabolism. It kind of competes with oxygen a little bit as well, and it tells that hemoglobin to, to unload its oxygen. So basically, increases in any of these things, temperature, hydrogen ion concentration, which is a decrease in pH, increases in carbon dioxide, increases in BPG in our blood are decreasing hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, allowing that hemoglobin to let go or unload the oxygen. So the oxygen will leave the blood and go to the tissues. Ultimately, it shifts the curve, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, it'll shift it to the right. If you do the opposite, if you lower temperature, for example, we'll look at our same amount of oxygen, 40 millimeters of mercury, here's what it should be normally, about 75% um, percent saturation hemoglobin is of oxygen. If you lower the temperature of the blood, that um, hemoglobin saturation goes up. More oxygen is loaded onto hemoglobin at a lower temperature. The curve is shifted to the left. If you decrease the amount of carbon dioxide, more oxygen is um, loaded onto hemoglobin at lowers amount, lower amounts of carbon dioxide. Um, and so that shift, again, the curve has been shifted to the left compared to our normal curve. So takeaways from this, temperature increases, carbon dioxide increases, lower pHs and increases in BP, BPG will all shift these hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curves to the right. And shifting to the right means that at the same amount of oxygen, less hemoglobin is saturated. There's less saturation. Less of that oxygen is on the hemoglobin, meaning the hemoglobin has unloaded its oxygen and the oxygen leaves the blood. So these things are happening when we are at the tissues. Um, let's see. What kinds of things can affect that delivery to the tissue? So again, recall, internal respiration. Oxygen is leaving the blood and going into the tissues. We need this to happen. This is the whole point of the respiratory system. And actually, this is the whole point of the cardiovascular system too. Get that oxygen to our tissues so our tissues can live and do their metabolism that they need to do. There are things that will affect that oxygen delivery. Not only those things we just talked about, increases in temperature, increases in carbon dioxide, so on and so forth, because Actually, I should say decreases, right? If we decrease these things, hemoglobin is going to hold on to that oxygen more tightly, and we're not going to be able to deliver it to our tissues if that's happening at our tissues. Um, but also other things, more basic things that will result in an in in inadequate delivery of oxygen to our tissues. Th this is what hypoxia is. There are different types of hypoxia. We talked about some of these in chapter 17 with the blood chapter. Anemias. We, we don't have enough red blood cells, we don't have enough or we don't have the right type of hemoglobin. So we're not even carrying enough oxygen to begin with. We're not, in here, we're not necessarily even talking about um, the ability of hemoglobin to unload that oxygen. It's now we're talking about, is there even enough oxygen to begin with? Um, other things, um, maybe you have what's called histotoxic hypoxia, the cells can't even use the oxygen. Um, maybe you're you're taking in a poison and it's interfering with the use of that oxygen. Maybe you're not even ventilating enough to begin with. Your lungs aren't working properly and it's not bringing in enough um, oxygen to begin with. So that's hypoxemic hypoxia. Another thing that can um, interfere with your ability to deliver that oxygen to your tissues is carbon monoxide poisoning. I think this has a lot to do, a little bit to do with histotoxic hypoxia. Not quite. Carbon monoxide directly competes for hemoglobin spots. It competes with oxygen for the same spots on hemoglobin. And not only that, hemoglobin has 
but 200 times greater affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen. So that means if there's carbon monoxide around, not only will the carbon monoxide want to um, attach itself to hemoglobin in the same place that oxygen wants to attach, but that hemoglobin would prefer to attach to carbon monoxide than it would to oxygen. It has a much tighter hold on carbon monoxide. Think of it like a magnet. It's almost like hemoglobin is a stronger magnet for carbon monoxide than it is for oxygen. And this is why carbon monoxide is so lethal because it just really basically depletes your hemoglobin's ability to hold on to any oxygen at all. And then we greatly, greatly lose our oxygen carrying capacity because if you go back to the very first slide that we started on today, almost all of our oxygen in our blood is being carried by carbon, by hemoglobin. And so if it can't do that, it's almost like we have no oxygen at all. All right, so I said I was gonna talk about a little bit more about how acid is related um, to this oxygen hemoglobin carrying process. Um, and it, it ha ultimately has to do with carbon dioxide. So taking a step back, carbon dioxide is also traveling in our blood and it travels in three different ways. A small amount of it is directly dissolved in our plasma. 20% of it is bound to hemoglobin. So we would refer to that type of hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin. Um, it does not bind to the same place that oxygen binds to though. It binds to a different place. However, as I said before, there it's still a case of hemoglobin can carry one or the other. I think that's the simplest way to think of it. If it's carrying carbon dioxide, it's not carrying oxygen and vice versa. Most of our carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ion, meaning it gets into our blood, it mixes with water, and it produces carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ion. And go back, let's go back to that other slide here where we initially said increases in hydrogen ion concentration will decrease hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, just like an increase in carbon dioxide will. That is because of this equation right here. When you're at the tissues, that carbon dioxide is getting into the blood, it's mixing with the water, and it's creating hydrogen ions, basically. Acid, it's, it's um, creating a low pH. So this is how carbon dioxide and acid or carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion levels go hand in hand because of this equation right here. We are going to see this again in a future chapter when we talk about acid-base balance. We're going to come back to this and we're going to use this to kind of figure out how your body can help maintain your pH levels. And if you're thinking about that a little bit right now, think about, okay, we're talking about the respiratory system can kind of control how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. If you can control that, you can control pH levels. So we're going to come back to that a little bit later in this semester. And then these two, um, there's two slides right here that show you pictures. Basically, um, this is describing in picture form, uh, honestly, it, it talks about it in terms of carbon dioxide, but you can look at this in terms of oxygen as well. What is going on in external respiration, or sorry, this is internal, internal respiration between the tissues and the blood. And the next slide is showing you external respiration between the blood and the tissues. So let's go back. Let's look at the tissues here. This is internal respiration. What's going on? Carbon dioxide is building up in the tissues. It's leaving the tissues and headed to the blood. A lot of it is headed to the red blood cells themselves. A lot of it is gonna mix with the water in the red blood cells and create acid, create bicarbonate ion. That bicarbonate ion wants to leave the red blood cell and go into the plasma. Because it's a negative charge and it's doing that, there's another ion, a negative ion called chloride that's in the plasma that will come back into the red blood cell to counteract the effect of this negative bicarbonate ion leaving just to keep the charge neutral within this red blood cell. That's what chloride shift is. 
Um, what else is this carbon dioxide doing when it's in the red blood cell? Some of it is um, combining with hemoglobin and becoming carbon amino hemoglobin, and that forces the oxygen off of the hemoglobin. This is why an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood is allowing hemoglobin to let go of its oxygen because the carbon dioxide is jumping onto that hemoglobin. So hemoglobin loses its oxygen, the oxygen leaves and goes to the tissues. What's happening in the lungs? The opposite. There's a lot of oxygen coming from the lungs and going to the tissues. And some of that oxygen is getting it, a lot of it, it's getting into the red blood cell and starting to try to latch onto that hemoglobin. There's a lot more oxygen now in this red blood cell than, than there is carbon dioxide. So the oxygen can sort of outcompete the carbon dioxide, jump on the hemoglobin. As soon as one oxygen jumps on, carbon dioxide is going to jump off and then more oxygens will jump on. Carbon dioxide jumps off leaves the blood, goes to the lungs. The um, bicarbonate ion that had um, was formed earlier comes back into the red blood cell. This equation goes in the opposite direction, so we're going to reform the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide leaves the red blood cell, goes to the tissue, goes to the lungs. Chloride will leave in response to that um, bicarbonate ion coming in. So again, this is just like in picture format, really close up of what's going on in internal and external respiration. Um, I just kind of talked about that already. Um, the last thing um, I'm going to mention here, only because we are coming back to this, I kind of showed you this already. This is telling you that Carbon dioxide levels in our blood can change the pH of our blood, and it has to do with what's called this carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. I'm going to go back to that equation. This is a buffer. We haven't talked about buffers yet. We're going to come back to this when we talk about acid-base balance. Carbon dioxide levels will influence the pH of our blood because of this equation right here. You add carbon dioxide to your blood, it's going to react with the water, it's going to make carbonic acid, it's going to make hydrogen ion, which lowers the pH of your blood. If you take carbon dioxide away from the blood, this reaction goes in the opposite direction and we lose acid. We raise the pH. So the presence of carbon dioxide in your blood will lower the pH of your blood the absence of carbon dioxide will raise the pH of your blood. And how do you alter carbon dioxide levels in your blood? Through the respiratory system. You either breathe out or in really quickly or you breathe more slowly. So your respiratory system can control your blood pH. We're going to see this again. How does that make sense? Let's, let's think about that. Slow, shallow breathing. If you're breathing slowly, there's a lot of time in between breaths. That means carbon dioxide is not leaving with, with your breath as quickly anymore. So if it's not leaving your lungs, it's staying in your blood. So slow breathing leads to a buildup of carbon dioxide in your blood, which is going to lower the pH. Whereas Rapid breathing or deep breathing, you're getting rid of, you're exhaling a lot of carbon dioxide. So if there's not as much in your blood, that's going to raise the pH. So changing carbon dioxide in your blood can change the pH of your blood. And you can think about that vice versa too. If the pH is changing due to some other issue, your respiratory system can fix it by altering the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood. So I'm going to leave it at, at that for now because we are coming back to this. The takeaway here from this section is really going back to these hemoglobin-oxygen dissociation curves. Do you understand what the curve is telling you? Do you understand what it means if the curve shifts to the right or shifts to the left? It changes how much hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen or how much oxygen is on that hemoglobin. 
Um, what are the factors that will change that hemoglobin saturation? And does it make sense that those changes are happening at the tissues and not at the lungs?